I love to see my name in lights. Um, well, as you know, um, tonight's uh, theme was meant to be easy is boring, thanks to Hester. Um, and to follow the brief would be easy. It would be boring. So I'm going to ignore it and do what I want to do, and I'll tell you why. Um, because of last year, I don't know, how many people were here last year? It was a great night, wasn't it? And uh, I just found it a really inspiring night. And obviously, as they say, I was here with uh, my daughter, Taylor, who's the best speaker, of course. And at the end of the night, they said, um, well, if you or anyone else you know would like to be a speaker at next year's event, let us know. And my wife said, well, you've got a big mouth, Mike, and darling, and, and you'd love to be the center of attention. And why don't you say a speech? I go, hmm, that's true, and I'd like to, but what am I going to talk about? You know, I'm, I'm a musician, and I work in music broadcasting, but am I going to talk about how great the Rolling Stones are, or how punk rock changed my life? Really? Does anyone really want to listen to that? But I thought, actually, I was struck by how many of the speakers, particularly the kids last year, had to use music as, uh, to, to illustrate their story of self-discovery. And then one of the other speakers, the esteemed Mr. Weeks, he spoke, and he talked about the power of communication. So I went away, and I thought, well, music's a form of communication, isn't it? And quite a powerful one. In fact, it always has been, actually, since the day of time. Since we first started, music's been a form of communication. So I know, I know, what, I know what I'll talk about. The role of music is a form of communication in human society, or everyone loves music, which is a catchier title, I think. Um, so the point of tonight's chat is not to talk about being a music obsessive like me or whether or not you should put your records in alphabetical order or chronological order, because obviously you should be alphabetical. Um, it's more about um, how music touches all our lives, whether we realize it or not. And I know some of the guys are here going, not me, mate, it's all about football. Yeah, footy for me, mate. But what happens if I play this? Hey, the football's on! Woo, match today! Music provokes an emotional response in you. And when you go to the football on Saturday, you'll sing, and you'll sing, and you'll sing. And that's how you identify with your team, is by singing your team song. And this is what we do as humans since the, the beginning of time. Ever since we could make sure, well, once we realized that the grunts we were making were being understood by other people in our clans, we set them to melodies. And it's because I think music is the purest form of human expression. It really is the best expression of the human spirit. Now, this is a Zulu tribe. Uh, humanity sort of emerged out of Africa thousands of years ago. And this is a Zulu tribe, I don't know specifically what they're singing and dancing, but I do know that whatever that song is, it's thousands, maybe tens of thousands of years old. And it's probably a modern photo, so afterwards they would have changed, gotten their jeans and t-shirts, maybe went to McDonald's. But what connects them to their past, to their culture, what ties them to the culture, is the music that has been handed down by their ancestors for thousands of years. And this happened throughout the world. Now, I haven't got music for it, but in your head, you probably got a pretty good idea with, with the songs. I, I won't get you to try and sing it together because it would be a cacophony of noise. But you've got a good, a good idea. Now, if I do something else, if I were to play music without images, you'll, you'll be able to identify where it comes from automatically. So we're, Mexico, that's right. You see the big sombrero? Oh, some... Hawaii, that's right. So, there's a brass skirt. On the beach where it's South Pacific, we took on it. A little closer to home. Another type of skirt. The only place in the world that has bagpipes for good reason. Tiny kangaroo down, small. Okay, Tiny not necessarily an ethnic down. culture, but Tiny you know where it comes from right away, don't you? Now, the point is, these aren't stereotypes, these are archetypes. These are musical expressions of a culture that they've built up over, in some cases, centuries, that we all instantly recognize. Now, whizzing forward thousands of years, and because this has happened uh, in different parts of the world, North America and East Asia and all places, um, whizzing ahead into, say, the early part of the, uh, the medieval period, particularly in, in Europe. And, uh, we have a sort of a, um, up until the 13th century, music's not really written down. And to be fair, not many things were. Um, but you get to a point where um, around 14, four, early 1400s, where theory and notation is kind of agreed upon, at least in Europe. And we get this. And what we have now is the next evolution, the next step in music as a communication device. Now we have music as a written language. 
And what I can do is I can hear a, a song in my head, and because I can read music, and I can sit down, and I can write down exactly what's in my head, and I can leave it for the lovely and talented Mr. Craig, who's hiding behind this curtain, who knows music, and he can read it, and without ever talking to me, or without ever hearing what I had in mind, can read what I've written for him, and sit at the piano and play it exactly as I intended. It's a music as a language form. Now, at this point, um, it's probably a good point to, to have a bit of a disclaimer. Music's a big subject. The history of music is an even bigger subject. History of the music in the whole wide world is an enormous subject. And I can't cover it all. So what I will do is quite wisely skirt away from music that I don't know a lot about, classical music, that's the music, and stick with the music I know a lot about, rock and roll. <laughs> and I'll tell you why, because rock and roll, pop music, has been the dominant form of music for, uh, well, for the last 40, 50 years. So how did we get to rock and roll? Well, rock and roll is a combination of two types of music. So for about 400 years, Africans were brought to America, or North America, uh, as, as slaves. And in, the, in, the, in America, particularly the American South, where the last place to, where slavery dies out, um, the African slaves are, are brought over. And of course, they, they bring their own music. They bring the rhythmic stuff that we saw with the Zulus. Um, but bizarrely, when they're in the, the fields, they start to adopt the music, the church music of their captors. So they start singing songs like Amazing Grace. And it's not surprising when you think about it, because these are songs about redemption, deliverance, salvation, the promised land. So they start to sing these songs, and they become, and they're uplifting, and they become known as Negro spirituals. And at the same time, they start to change some of the words, and they kind of codify it so they can sing and communicate with each other through song without the masters knowing. And slavery ends, thank God, but the lives of blacks don't really, doesn't really change, particularly in the American South. So the spiritual uplifting music becomes gospel music. And the earthy sort of day-to-day uh, -day music becomes rhythm and blues. Da -na -na -na. Woke up this morning, and yeah, my life was still rubbish. And that's kind of what they sing <laughs> into the early part of the 20th century. At the same time, they've got the sort of what we think of as their white counterpart. And it's sort of r rural, poor white people who live, again, in the American South. And they've, they're playing a folk music that they've, their ancestors have brought over, particularly from these islands, which is Celtic folk music. And that turns into what we would call country and western music. Now, country and western music and rhythm and blues music are rather similar. Structurally, 12 bars, three chords, and they use wordplay to talk amongst themselves with their own language. So it goes and goes and goes and into the 20th century, and then we get to this. You ain't nothing but a hand. Then we get rock and roll. Now Elvis wasn't the only rock and roll star. He wasn't even the first. But he was certainly the biggest. And his influence went on and on. I'll come back to that. But how did we get to Elvis? Well, the technology of music and how it changed music and made it more of a communication device um, is an interesting thing to look at. So going back to sheet music, um, in the uh, sort of Victorian times, the early Edwardian times, um, you know, if you wanted, in, before that, if you wanted to hear music, you had to go to church on Sunday to listen to it, or if you're rich, you went to a concert. If you're poor, you went to the beer hall, or you might sing around the campfire. But it was, it was, a, it was a sort of a social thing you had to go out and do. Now, with the growing middle classes of the Victorian and Edwardian times, you'd have a front parlor and probably the piano in it. So sheet music becomes very, very popular. And so you'd have people around and you play your favorite songs on your own piano. And you might take the sheet music and lend it to your friend and you're the original file sharers. And <laughs> then another invention happens that leads to a series of innovations that utterly changes music as a communication form because it starts it from being local, it makes it global, and that's electricity. Now, with the advent of electricity, the first innovation is the wax cylinder. So Thomas Edison, who made the light bulb, makes the wax cylinder, which becomes a record. So now, not only do you not have to go out to the Beeler Hall to hear music or sit at home and play your own music, now someone can record a performance and you can sit at home and listen to that over and over and over again. Revolutionizes music. At the same time, we've got the advent of radio, which is an oral uh, medium. And obviously, people talk on it, you hear the news, but you hear lots and lots of music. And B the BBC and NBC and all these big radio companies would hire in-house um, orchestras who would provide theme music or incidental music or just music to entertain people. Uh, at the same time, um, we've got the rise of cinema. Now, cinema in the early days is silent, right? 
and it's just a visual thing. But it's not a very satisfactory uh, experience. So pretty soon, cinema owners are hiring piano players to provide a music accompaniment for the films. So when you see a Charlie Chaplin film with that herky-jerky, plinky-plonky piano, that's not the original soundtrack, but it's a pretty good representation of what you heard if you'd sat in cinema in 1920. Then they invent the sound film. Now, who knows what the first film talkie was? Anybody? That's right, the first film with sound was a movie about music. I don't think that's coincidence. So, but what's interesting about this now is that um, not only can the director get the uh, actors to talk and speak the lines, but he's got another tool in his arsenal, and that's a soundtrack, his music. And he can c manipulate the audience's emotions with the music that he chooses. And if you think of famous ones like Psycho, very synonymous with uh, the film, and there's another really famous one um, that is so simple that uh, when the director, when the composer first played it to the director, he said, you're kidding me, right? Like everyone's looking under their feet, looking for a shark to bite their legs off. So even if you've never heard, never saw Jaws, and never heard that music before, it sounds ominous. I mean, you know something bad's about to happen. That music communicates a feeling to you. So the next uh, sort of innovation is the microphone. And in the 20s and 30s, the rock stars of the day were the band leaders, like Benny Goodman, Count Basie. Um, and they would have soloists, but it was hard to, for a singer to compete with a 20-piece band in a music hall until the invention of the microphone. Suddenly, the singer came to the forefront. That's when you get Bing Cosby. That's when you get Frank Sinatra. And then with the popularity of TV in the 50s, that's when you get Elvis. So you get all those sort of innovations come together. Now, after that, in the 50s, um, you know, people dismissed it. It's a, it's a teenage fad, it'll go away. And for a while, in the early 60s, it looked like that might just happen. And then these dudes came along. Dun, dun, dun. The Beatles came, and everything changed. And I mean everything. And it's not an exaggeration to say the Beatles had an impact on every facet of life in the Western world, at least, and, and in other parts of the world as well. Not only did they change the way we play and listen, record, write, everything about music, but they also had an impact on the other adjacent popular cultures, fashion, haircuts, cinema, literature, art, all together. And their effect on popular culture was so pervasive, it spilt into all parts of life, business, religion, and politics. So in 1963, 64, they're singing, I want to hold your hand. And that's what they meant, I want to hold your hand. But 1967, 68, they're saying all you need is love. But what they mean is stop the war. Because this is when the Vietnam War is wrapping up. And the counterculture is speaking out against the war. But suddenly, they're not just pop stars. These are spokesmen for a generation, like Bob Dylan. And people are listening to them, and they're having an effect. Their music is communicating a displeasure with the way things are. So I won't say the Beatles stopped the Vietnam War, the counterculture for which they're the poster boys of certainly did. Now the Vietnam War was part of a bigger conflict, as we know as the Cold War, which is an ideological battle between the liberal Western democracies and uh, the Soviet communism. And it's, it's a, essentially a battle for you know, personal liberty. And the people who live behind the, the Iron Curtain, you know, when they're longing for what they saw as you know, Western freedom, and they're trading on the black market with Western goods. You know what the most popular things were? Blue jeans and Beatle records. Because that, those symbols, those very epitome of rock and roll, is what symbolized freedom to them. The, the, the shrill, sheer thrill of a three minute rock and roll song was signified personal liberty that they, they, they longed for, and we take for granted. Now, and this is because I think music is the perfect expression of the human spirit. And when, the, uh, when NASA sent the uh, Voyager space probe into space, I think in the 70s, and its mission was to fly into space and send back information and pictures uh, from its travels and keep going forever until we couldn't get anything back from it. But there's also a device on Voyager, and it's a recording. And the hope is that eventually some other life form might find it. And there's a greeting, there's a recording, there's a greeting of every language on Earth. 
but there's no political speeches, <coughs> there's no football commentary, there's lots of music, Mozart, Beethoven, Chuck Berry. Can you imagine, after all this time, we meet E.T., and the first thing he hears is Johnny Be Good. I think that's brilliant. <laughs> that's because music is the perfect expression of the human spirit. It's what unifies, it's what brings us together. It's the language we all speak, even though we don't speak the same language. We know a happy song when we hear it. It brings us together. And if we could only get the Taliban to listen to Lady Gaga records, the world would be a better place. Thank you, good night. <laughs>